Hello, I am Pastor Jefferson Cox of Grace Lutheran Church here in Clearwater, Florida. Welcome to our service of the word for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Whether you've been a member of our congregation for all of its 60 years, or these are the first 60 seconds you've encountered one of our worship services, or anywhere in between, we are all called into the worship experience. Welcome. In Deuteronomy, God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses, who will speak for God. In Psalm 111, God shows the people the power of God's works. For the church, these are ways of pointing to the unique authority people sensed in Jesus' actions and words. We encounter that authority in God's word around which we gather, the word that prevails over any lesser spirit that would claim power over us, freeing us to follow Jesus. Our service begins with confession and forgiveness and the gathering hymn. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. We continue with the greeting 
and the prayer of the day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are invited to prepare your hearts and minds for the scripture readings, the sermon, and the hymn of the day. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18. Today's reading is part of a longer discourse in Deuteronomy an updating of the law for the Israelite community as the people wait to enter the promised land. Here, Moses assures the people that God will continue to guide them through prophets who will proclaim the divine word. The reading. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up from, for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 111. The sound for the day is read responsively. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered you are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You send redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is concerned about the way some Corinthian Christians use their freedom in Christ as license to engage in non-Christian behavior that sets a damaging example to other impressionable believers. Christians have a responsibility to each other that their behavior does not cause another to sin. The reading. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all, all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. death and disease have taken hold of a man, yet they recognize Jesus and know what his power means for them. Jesus commands these forces to leave, and people are amazed at his authority. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, in the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent! And come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority! He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome once again to our service of the word. At this point in the service, it is my privilege and opportunity to share with you a message that's based on our lessons. And yes, I'm going to focus on our gospel lesson today, but I'm also going to talk about our second reading, that uh, passage from the eighth chapter of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, and uh, what it can teach us about how we are called to be uh, in fellowship and in community with each other as God's people. As we continue through these Sundays after Epiphany, we continue with the theme, how is God revealed to the world? How is God shown to the world? How is the power of God shown to the people of this world? And in our gospel lesson today, we see an aspect of that revelation in terms of God's authority and power over the spirits within our world that seek to do us harm, that seek to, to uh, hurt us, uh, confuse us, lead us away from who we are called to be as God's people. And of course, uh, if you were reading the Gospel of Mark from beginning, um, from the very beginning, all through, and then including today's lesson, you would have already seen that Jesus himself uh, had to gone out into the wilderness and had been tempted 
by the devil and had already faced down the devil's temptations. The Gospel of Mark doesn't have a lot of detail or really any detail in regards to what those temptations were. We find those details in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But Mark does say that Jesus went into the wilderness after his baptism and was tempted by the devil. And so now we see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and as he's traveling to uh, Capernaum uh, and he goes then into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he teaches in the synagogue uh, and people are amazed that he teaches uh, with authority and it, it's kind of a funny way that they put it. Um, he teaches with authority, not like the scribes. So I'm guessing the scribes in those day uh, would teach uh, not as someone saying, well, I know what it says, uh, but more probably things like, well, I think what it says is, or uh, uh, it appears to say, or, or something like that. When Jesus instead taught, it says this, uh, which of course we understand uh, he had every right and uh, every authority to do so because um, he is part of God that uh, inspired those words and, uh, and of course is, his role is to teach and to be God among us. And so of course he, he has that authority uh, beyond anything else in all creation uh, to do that teaching. And so it must have been a remarkable experience to be in that synagogue on that Sabbath day and to be taught by Jesus himself. But then uh, a spirit, um, having possessed a person, makes an appearance. And in essence, uh, does so um, maybe to challenge Jesus or uh, the, the person who's possessed was able to get himself before Jesus so that Jesus might be able to help him. I'm, I'm not sure what, the, um, what brought that person who was possessed by a spirit into the presence of Jesus. But of course, then we see that Jesus' authority and power goes beyond just teaching, but actually has power over the, uh, the spirits in our world that seek to do us harm. Uh, that seek to lead us away from God. And we see that, that healing of that, of that person, which, uh, again, is the first of many that we'll see as we work our way through the Gospel of Mark and as we're familiar with the other Gospels, that this is a main part of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus uh, confronting the spirits of this world that lead us away from God. In our modern understanding of how the world works and how the world is a lot of people think that what that person was really dealing with was uh, some kind of mental illness others believe in uh, actual entities of uh, malevolence that uh, would seek to do us harm and to seek to hurt us uh, and uh, so there's a differing opinion as to what Jesus was actually confronting, the nature of that, of the spirits that, that Jesus was confronting and, and, uh, and removing uh, from those that he was curing. All I can say in terms of my own personal experience is I've never really experienced a, an actual malevolent spirit, though I, I do uh, have an experience of uh, uh, of experiencing uh, kind of a, an evil presence, an evil force, an evil power. And that, um, that was uh, brought to my recollection um, the other day when we were uh, having the National Day of Remembrance for the Holocaust. Uh, and that was an experience where I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was well, winding my way through the through the museum and the way it's set up is that it takes you on a journey, uh, a chronological journey through uh, the experiences of the Jewish people in Germany um, and other places in Europe uh, as the, the Nazi government uh, spread its influence and increased its uh, 
efforts to uh, scapegoat and then um, uh, harm and, uh, and kill uh, the Jewish people uh, in an effort to uh, commit uh, genocide against them. In the very middle of that museum, so in the very middle of that uh, journey, uh, you, you, of course, you're taken past um, displays which uh, show personal items and, and, and so on uh, from those that uh, have been victims in the Holocaust, uh, but you can't really touch or feel anything. But when you get to the middle of the, of the museum, there is, you, you have to, to continue through the museum, you have to climb up into a railroad car, uh, a freight car, an actual freight car that was used to transport uh, Jewish people and others to the concentration camps, to the death camps. And in that railroad car, in that freight car, I experienced a, a feeling, a presence of, of, uh, of evil that I have never experienced a, a, a presence of evil that powerful uh, in my life uh, before or since. The, the evilness that uh, it kind of just seeped into the, into the walls, into the floors of that, into the roof of that, of that rail car. Uh, it was, was palpable, you could feel it. And so in that sense, I, I think there's, there is evil that's so evil that it, it's tangible. And perhaps these are the, the kinds of things that uh, Jesus was confronting in people that as they were overcome by spirits so evil that they were tangible. I know that we, in our world today, we struggle with, with different spirits in a sense. Uh, we struggle with the same spirits that uh, are part of our sinful nature, uh, spirits of unkindness, uh, spirits of animosity, uh, spirits of um, selfishness, uh, spirits of, of suspicion, uh, spirits of jealousy, and so on. Uh, these uh, uh, kind of ideas or concepts or uh, just ways of thinking that seem to overtake people and, and even change who they are as people to the point where uh, the people around them uh, can barely recognize who they are and, uh, and, uh, not, and they struggle to understand what they're even talking about uh, and, and so on. And, and sometimes uh, we encounter these kinds of spirits uh, when people get caught up in cults uh, and uh, as their family and friends try to uh, maintain connections with them, it becomes increasingly more difficult because of the way that the cults ex um, extend their mind control um, over and their, their influence over those people that they become more and more disconnected uh, from their family and friends, anyone who might be able to challenge the authority of the cult leader or the, the cult uh, kind of message or mindset. And we see that in, in other ways as well as uh, sometimes uh, friendships are broken because uh, somebody is, uh, was friends with somebody but then um, they got a new friend and that new friend uh, just kind of takes away the, the friendship uh, um, that was already there and, and, and tries to take one of the friends and makes them their friend at the exclusion of the original friend and so on. We, we see that kind of spirit at work, which is kind of a spirit of, of coveting uh, when you covet somebody else's uh, relationship, as Luther talks about in, the, uh, in the, uh, his explanations of the commandments. Um, you know, we're, not, we're called not to covet someone else's relationships and, and, and then leads to you know, trying to take those. Uh, and so we, we confront these kinds of spirits all the time. And I think it's helpful to remember that uh, the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is still greater and more powerful than any of the other spirits that we encounter in our world. 
and that the authority of Jesus is greater than any other authority that we have uh, in our world. And so we as God's people are called to pay particular attention to the spirits that surround us and the spirits that, that try to take away our, our focus and try to take away our, um, our, the preeminence of, of the place of Jesus in our lives and in our hearts and replace uh, Jesus with some other entity or some other spirit or some other mindset or some other belief uh, to, to worship and to put our trust in rather than Jesus himself. And that leads us to our second reading. This uh, advice that Paul gives to the church in Corinth regarding something that in our day and age, something we don't really have to ever worry about or deal with. But back in the time of Paul, it was a real huge issue uh, how Christians should approach uh, the opportunity to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. So what was going on is you know, all these pagan uh, rituals um, would involve animal sacrifice, much as the um, worship of God in the temple in Jerusalem would also involve animal sacrifice. It was a very common thing in those days. Uh, is still practiced in some, some places today, but most people have kind of given that up and, and don't uh, harm animals in the course of a, uh, of a worship service. Uh, but back in the day, it was, a, it was a very common thing. And so once a, an animal was sacrificed, uh, they didn't want the, the animal to go to waste. And so the temple would make the meat uh, available to uh, the population for a price, and it was uh, usually uh, very, very highly sought meat. Why? Well, because they were using the best animals for the sacrifices. They were using the healthiest animals for the sacrifices, the biggest animals for the sacrifices, and so on. So that meat would have been kind of the best meat available in the ancient world. And so it was highly sought after, and so, uh, and so it was kind of a status symbol to be seen eating that kind of meat, that you could afford to eat that meat that was sacrificed to um, Jupiter, or sacrificed to Apollo, or sacrificed to uh, uh, Ra, the Egyptian god, or, or whatever. Uh, so if you were able to afford that food, that was a status symbol. And so Christians were wondering, well, should we eat this food? And on one hand, uh, it was seen as a way of honoring that God. And so some Christians were saying, no, don't eat that food sacrificed to that idol, to that God, uh, idol to that God, because that's a way of worshiping that God. And then other Christians were saying, well, it doesn't matter. Those gods don't exist. That's just meat. Uh, just because somebody thought it was a sacrifice to a particular God. If that God doesn't actually exist, it just makes it meat uh, and not something to be avoided. And so Paul was trying to uh, give advice on how to resolve that uh, disagreement. And basically what Paul says is, uh, you are allowed to eat food sacrificed to idols because as those say, those gods don't actually exist, so it's just meat. However, if by doing that, you confuse and, uh, and uh, those that still can't get out of the mindset, the old mindset that those gods are also real, even if they love and believe in Jesus, they might still think, because they grew up in that pagan um, culture, they might still think at a certain level that those gods are real. And so if it bothers them, and makes them think that, well, I can worship both Jupiter and Jesus, but it's better not to eat that food and, and confuse them. Help them understand that there really is just one God and, and be kind to them. So Paul, what Paul was talking about was a spirit of kindness, a spirit of patience, a spirit of understanding, a, a spirit of, of empathy, towards those 
folks. And so, people of God, we are indeed called to be mindful of the spirits that surround us and the spirits that are within us. And when we discover that we uh, are using a spirit that is um, not uh, a spirit that's compatible with our Holy Spirit, uh, things again like hate, of jealousy, of unkindness, of cruelty, of indifference, and, and so on. We are indeed called into a place of repentance to put our trust in the spirit of the one who loved us so much that he died on the cross for our sins. And then God raised him from the dead to destroy the power of death over us. We are called, therefore, to live in the spirit of life, in the spirit of truth, in the spirit of love. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into a series of prayers, starting with the prayers of intercession. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders, for the church and its ministries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all God's works and creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists, Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with HIV and AIDS, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, those impacted by COVID-19, and all in any need especially those on the prayer list of our congregation and those we name now with our lips or in our hearts. For caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the concerns of this congregation, those who travel, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, for the people of God in this place and for other needs in our community, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism and thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, especially those within our memorial garden, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Offerings to the Mission and Ministry of Grace can be made online at gracelw.com. Look for the Donate button. Or by mailing a check to Grace Luther Church, 1812 North Highland Avenue, Clearwater, Florida, 33755. You can also fill out an attendance form on our website. If you're new to Grace through our online services, please consider sharing a little bit about yourself through our attendance forms. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray in the language closest to our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now transition from worship to service with the blessing, sending him, and dismissal. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. God.